Good morning, everyone. It's 10 o'clock and um, it's time for day three of the North Texas Outdoor Watering Summit. We have a full agenda today and we're going to jump right into our first set of presentations. But first, I want to let you know that Holly Holt Torres from Dallas Water Utilities is our Q&A moderator today. So um, make sure and put your question in for her and she'll make sh she'll make sure to um, ask talk to our speakers about them. Also, we're going to have more trivia during the break today. So coffee up and get ready for today's questions. Our first set of presentations this morning is from two water conservation experts. We're so glad that they can be here today. Um, they're going to talk to us about water savings potential from landscape transformation and what customers want out of their landscapes. I think you'll find their presentations very informative. Um, our first speaker, Marianne Dickinson, is very well known to us. She's the president and CEO of the Alliance for Water Efficiency. Marianne has over 40 years of experience in water resources and efficiency. She's going to go first, but I'm going to go ahead and introduce our second speaker so we can have a nice flow this morning. Maureen Urbesnik is the founder of Maureen Urbesnik, excuse me, Urbesnik and Associates, a consulting firm specializing in strategic planning program operational design and implementation, as well as development of innovative um, marketing campaigns and strategies. Throughout her career, Maureen has designed, implemented, and assessed over 50 major residential, commercial water and energy efficiency programs, and including authoring the Alliance's landscape transformation market analysis. Um, we're so glad to have Maureen and Marianne join us from the West Coast, where it's early. Um, let's go ahead and get started and I'll pass the mic to Marianne. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, yes, this is me in the picture. <laughs> I don't look the same as I did in the, the shot that you originally saw. I'm wearing the same outfit though, so you know it's me. Uh, this is my COVID hair. <laughs> so uh, hopefully you also recognize me and um, uh, are still connecting with us at the Alliance for Water Efficiency. Um, what we want to talk to you about today is um, our whole outdoor water savings research initiative, but we want to focus on the landscape transformation study because I think it's one that is very applicable to what you've been covering in all of your sessions here at the North Texas uh, watering, Outdoor Watering Summit. Uh, so next slide. So I want to give you a little bit of background as to why we did it. Um, we uh, we, we do a strategic plan like lots of organizations do. And in our uh, past two strategic plans, we've been emphasizing the fact that, yes, we've made lots of great progress on the indoor side, but the outdoor side still remains an issue and needs to remain a main conservation priority, not only in program, but in research. Um, we still are finding that outdoor water use uh, at the consumer level is poorly understood, largely unregulated, uh, ripe for innovation and improvement. Uh, these are the words from our strategic plan, uh, not just at the consumer level, but also at the landscape contractor and designer levels. And these are all issues that uh, Maureen will talk about uh, from our study. Uh, next slide. So when we started this whole initiative, we decided the first thing to do would be to um, conduct a little bit of research and take a look at what exactly has already been done. So the large uh, picture on the left of the slide that says Outdoor Water Savings Research Initiative is a project that we commissioned. Um, Peter Mayer uh, was the principal author of this to take a look at what research had been published on outdoor water programs on savings and on issues and identify where the holes were. Where, where do we need to research topic areas in the outdoor sector that have not been adequately researched? So this phase one report is, is posted on our website. It's a terrific read. And what it basically identifies is 12 different areas of research that had not been covered really at all in the water conservation literature. Um, and among those 12 areas are things like what's the impact of native water-wise and xeric landscapes versus turf in water use and cost? What's the impact of water rate structures on demand? Uh, what's the impact of landscape contractor training, uh, education and certification? What are the reasons and rationale for consumer landscape choices? Um, what's the impact of regional variability? There's a list of 12 of these. And so what we did was we went to our research committee 
um, we formed a sort of a, a special uh, project group of outdoor water experts and said, here are these 12 areas, what shall we study? And there were three areas that were identified for us to start on. One was peak day water demand management, you know, a very small study on that, uh, our landscape transformation study that I'm gonna spend most of the time talking about, and then a, a drought restriction study. Uh, next slide, please. So just a few words about the peak uh, day water demand management study. Uh, again, you can download this from our website. Uh, what it did was it tested how utilities could have remote control of customer irrigation systems uh, to manage peak demand. And this was a request that came in from uh, one of our water utility members on the East Coast. So this isn't necessarily just a, a Western water issue. This is an issue for utilities everywhere across uh, the US and Canada. So Raccio donated some controllers. We decided to do a study. Uh, they picked a neighborhood in this uh, utility service area that was hugely problematic in terms of peak. And we conducted these experiments in July and August. <laughs> it ended up being in Bruce Springsteen's neighborhood, which I think is pretty funny. It's Rumson, New Jersey. Um, he wasn't one of the study sites though, darn. <laughs> um, but there were 15 residential study sites. So it's a small sample. And they did find though that remote shifting was found to succeed successfully occur in 14 of them. The 15th uh, owner just manually overrode everything, so he, he, we, he was removed from the study. So we'd like to do a lot more of this. We know peak demand and managing peak demand is a, is a big issue, not necessarily always in terms of savings, but in shifting uh, that peak load. Uh, next slide, please. So we also, as I mentioned, uh, did a drought restriction study, which we did um, release uh, earlier this year. And there were 14 participating and funding agencies and Texas was well represented. Uh, we had Austin and Plano and the Lower Colorado River Authority all participating in this study. So uh, take a look, there's the link to it. Uh, those are the research questions that were asked uh, in the study. And, and fundamentally what we really wanted to do was find out you know, when, when savings occur, are they permanent? Uh, are they uh, tied to whether it's mandatory or whether it's voluntary? Um, what are the savings uh, potentials from just restrictions alone if you don't do anything else? Um, so it's a study that I think is worth taking a look at. Um, and I just wanted to mention it briefly uh, here because that's the third uh, leg of the stool that we've uh, been doing in the research. Uh, next slide, please. But let's move to the landscape transformation study because that's the subject of this presentation. And it's divided into two pieces. Um, there's a landscape program water savings piece that analyzed what the range of savings uh, were that occurred uh, from uh, uh, landscape programs that were initiated by water utilities and requirements that would put on the, on the customers for those programs. And uh, then there was a second piece that really looked at the customer motivations and the market readiness uh, for transforming landscapes, you know, getting at that motivational issue and then the reasons and the rationale for their landscape choices and, and how we can move forward with this. What did we find in the study were barriers. And, and that's gonna be what Maureen will talk about uh, pretty extensively. It's a, it's a very big finding in the study. Um, we, we wanted to make sure that the programs that utilities would design would have very much uh, traction with their customers and, and with the landscape contractors that were working on those landscapes. So she'll, she'll talk about that. Uh, next slide. So um, we had a big study team to put this together. As you can imagine, it's, it was a very large study. Uh, a and Technical Services, Tom Chestnut, who's well known to many of you, uh, led the impact analysis part. Uh, Maureen uh, led the, the customer research and market readiness part. Um, Cindy Dybala of Sligo Creek Resources also uh, was part of the research team. And Peter Mayer, um, are one of our AWA technical advisors and uh, principal at WaterDM, he managed uh, the project. So we had uh, you know, a real dream team working on this uh, study and uh, putting together uh, some terrific information that um, is, is available in all the documents. We also, of course, uh, supported it from the AWA staff and all of the uh, members, utility members who contributed data were part of a project advisory committee. Uh, so next slide. So here you see who all they are. Um, we had 17 partners and participants in this study. Uh, Texas was represented by Austin Water. Um, we didn't have any other Texas folks there, but Austin was a terrific participant. Um, we have good representation from the West, but we also had representation, interestingly enough, from Canada. 
uh, from the uh, city of Seattle, um, from other parts of the, the country, not just what we, we would be perceived as uh, just the arid uh, west. The region of Peel is in um, uh, Eastern Canada. So uh, it's, it's very interesting that they, uh, they had done quite a bit of work in landscape transformation. So their information was very useful. Uh, Guelph also is in Eastern Canada. Both are in Ontario, in the province of Ontario. So they were great participants uh, in the project as well. Uh, next slide. So let's just first start by discussing terms because one of the issues that came up as we were starting the study was a uniform understanding of what those terms mean so that we could gather information in a consistent way. So the, the definition that we came up with for landscape transformation so that we would be collecting data in the same scale was that it's the act of customers transitioning from traditional high water use landscape designs and products to water efficient and sustainable landscapes. Uh, and the purpose of it is to reduce the irrigation water requirement and outdoor water use. So that's the definition that we use for landscape transformation. And uh, similarly, we came up with one for sustainable landscapes so that we make sure we were all, again, speaking the same language. And we defined sustainable landscapes as those that feature climate appropriate landscape designs and efficient technologies. Uh, they are maintained through efficient irrigation practices and they support homeowner goals, community water objectives and healthy watersheds. And the last one's very important because homeowner goals are a real piece to understanding how to make these programs successful. If you're not meeting homeowner goals, uh, your landscape is not long-term gonna be sustainable because the homeowner's gonna change it. Um, so these are, these are the two definitions that we used uh, in moving forward with the study. Uh, next slide. So now we get to the impact analysis part. I've given you all the background to get us here. And what we essentially did in this study is we evaluated the savings that would come from uh, nine different landscape transformation programs. And uh, some, they're listed here in, in the broad groups. Uh, rebates for efficient irrigation technology. So uh, controller rebates and uh, uh, rebates for maintaining and replacing uh, parts of the system to make them more efficient, uh, sprinkler valves, et cetera. Um, free distribution of mulch, that was also a considered uh, program. A customer site audits and education, and then turf removal and re-landscaping. Uh, so all of those were analyzed and we, we adjusted for the diverse geographies and climates um, and uh, 14 different uh, programs came from those nine basic areas. Uh, next slide. So what did we find? It saves water. Landscape transformation saves water. All of the programs of every type generated meaningful water savings. That's the main finding of this study. Um, the average participant savings ranged from 7% uh, if it was only outreach and support to a high of 39% for the actual turf removal uh, programs. 39% um, is a pretty high number. So, uh, what the study does is it shows what those savings are by program type and uh, what went into making sure those programs were successful. And one of the findings that came from the study was it was very clear that uh, higher water savings occurred when there was higher pre-intervention water use. In other words, if you, if you work more closely with the customer to start with, you, you achieved higher water savings in the long run. If you passively let it happen, you didn't get the same savings as you would if you got involved at the front end and did um, you know, some pre-intervention uh, work with the customer. Uh, next slide. So here are a couple of examples, and I, we have Austin Water up there in the upper left-hand corner, so I'll start with them. Um, Austin Water, our population served is a little under uh, a million people, 928,000. Average annual precipitation, 32 inches a year. Uh, the program type that we looked at was their turf removal and replacement program, and their average participant water savings was 18.9%, almost 19%. Uh, each participant savings was 19%, so it was a very good number. Uh, Petaluma, which is a community in Northern California, a uh, smaller community, still about 60,000 people, um, less in terms of precipitation, only 25 inches. Uh, the, what they did in their program was a free distribution of mulch. So it wasn't a very extensive program, but they still found some incredible savings as a result. Uh, their average participant savings was a little over 13%. 
Um, and then the San Diego County Water Authority, uh, serving over 3 million people, uh, average annual precipitation only 10 inches. Uh, they did a number of programs, education, technology rebates, technical assistance. They had a very high uh, average participant savings, 34.8%. Uh, and the reason for that high number was that they, they spent a, a lot of time working with all of the uh, San Diego households on it. Uh, it turned out to be uh, 42,000 gallons annually per participant in San Diego, which is the equivalent of meeting the needs of a four person household in San Diego for nearly 100 days. So this was a very cost-effective and successful program uh, for the region. Uh, next slide. So this is my last slide, and uh, we'll talk through it a little bit here. Uh, there are two points that we want to make here. One is that we did find that landscape programs effectively reduce peak demand. We talked about peak demand a little bit in the opening of the, of the presentation. You know, reducing your peak demand <clears throat> is a really important benefit of outdoor uh, programs because the, the, the peak in meeting the peak, developing infrastructure and water supply to meet an artificially high peak is very expensive. So to the extent you can reduce the peak, you're reducing your system costs for the utility uh, and that's a, that's a real benefit. Um, and these programs do that. Um, the, the chart you see is from Austin and it shows uh, their single family residential turf participants and it shows the, the seasonal pattern of the blue line is before the peak line before the program and then the red line is the, uh, the pattern uh, the program after. Uh, so it, it very much reduced peak. Uh, it saved of course quite a bit of water but uh, it had the effect of reducing that uh, summer peak which was really an important uh, benefit to the uh, Austin water utility system. Um, on the right hand side, you see this is the Southern Nevada Water Authority, which uh, had enormous savings potential. Uh, they're the 39% number that I uh, quoted at the beginning. Uh, and the thing about this particular chart that was a, a fascinating finding for me, I never expected this, is that the water savings persist. Uh, we always assume that there's going to be savings decay, that the, that the savings from the programs that we institute are not going to persist over time. But that wasn't true with these landscape transformation programs. And this chart of the Southern Nevada Water Authority makes clear that water savings were observed to persist and increase over time, um, not just decrease as you might expect uh, in other uh, programs. So that was a very interesting finding that um, you know, surprised us. And um, it's, it's actually good news for the investment that you make in these programs, especially turf replacement, it's an expensive program, but you're getting the, the savings and the results from it. So this is my last slide before we move into the market analysis piece. Um, and um, uh, Jennifer and Holly, if you'd like to have it opened up for questions, that would be great. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you so much for your wonderful presentation on landscape transformation and the landscape transformation study. Uh, we have just a couple of minutes and a couple of questions, so that works out nicely. The first question is from Holly Dickman. The question is, do you know how water savings from a mulch distribution event was calculated? Ah, <laughs> oh boy. Um, Maureen, can you help me with this one? Yeah, uh, thanks, Maureen. Um, I think, you know, it was evaluated in the same way that all of the other programs were evaluated, where they looked at pre and post usage and accounted for any noise and, um, you know, um, adjusted for weather, et cetera. One thing about it, it wasn't just giving away mulch, it was actually mulch sheeting. So these are people that were going to actually remove their turf. They were do-it-yourselfers. So they got not just mulch, they got other pieces of um, equipment that were necessary to actually do the mulch sheeting. And they actually I mean, they would drive up to the, this is a very unique community too in Petaluma, just so you know that they would drive up and drop off yards and yards of mulch in people's driveways. So in some areas, this not may not be a program that, that could work, but what was, you know, like Marianne talked about, what was so interesting was that just that just doing that, they saved 13%. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you, Maureen. The second final question is from Clint with AgriLife. The question is, how was rainfall normalized for the Austin study to calculate savings? Oh, I wish I had Tom Cheston on the phone to do that, to answer that question. Um, so Maureen, can you help me with that one too? 
Yeah, I think we'd have to follow up. I'm not exactly sure the technical aspect Tom could. We could follow up and get an answer from Tom on that one. Yeah, Tom does normalize for weather. That's a standard feature of how he does his econometric analysis. So the, these were all savings calculations from metered records and econometrically uh, analyzed. So how he normalized the weather would be a very good question for him, and I'd be happy to have him contact you, Clint. Thank you so much. And then just one quick final question. I think we have just a couple of seconds more. Uh, the final question is, did your studies include alternative water supplies like rainwater harvesting? No. We didn't focus on that, no. Uh, we, that's, that's actually another study we should probably do. Uh, and that's on the list of the research topics. But we wanted to focus on, you know, supplied drinking water from a water utility and, and what the cost effective uh, reductions for that might be in the landscape sector. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Marianne, and um, everyone there at the North Texas Outdoor Summit, Outdoor Watering Summit. Um, hoping at the end of the, my presentation that we'll have a lot more Q&A so that we can really open up the conversation about what we need to do as an industry to to, 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 to help transform the market. Because as Marianne talked about, there really are some still some really significant issues still, still out there that we need to focus on. So the market analysis that we did consisted of multiple parts. We had an attitudinal survey, which was conducted in the nine communities listed there on the slide in throughout US and Canada. And this was for both customers that have participated and non-participants of landscape programs. So there was everything from landscape lawn replacement programs in Austin, in, in Southern Nevada, and in San Diego, and then, you know, education programs in Guelph and Peel, and equipment programs in Sacramento and Seattle. So we looked at all different types of programs, and then we also talk, um, surveyed non-participants. In addition, we interviewed water agencies as well as irrigation equipment manufacturers, retailers, suppliers, and the vendors that run the programs. And all of this culminated in a comprehensive report of the landscape transformation market condition and, and recommend, recommendations to move the market forward with our goal to significantly reduce irrigation requirements of properties and transform the market. The details are available in, I think the report's like 80 pages long, um, at, but there's also an executive summary which can be found on AWE's website at allianceforwaterefficiency.org. But today I just wanted to talk to about a few critical customer needs that if we address appropriately, I believe we can really drive significant gains in the landscape transformation path. Next slide. So first and something I think most of us knew was that customers are generally disconnected from their outdoor water use. Uh, many of the customers believe that they use more water indoors and that they regularly change their irrigation schedule. They, they also stated that 56% of them stated that they have smart controllers, which we just know isn't true. You know, based upon irrigation equipment sales, we know that they're, you know, less than 20% of sales of uh, controllers are weather-based or smart timers. Um, so this may be a halo effect where customers wanted to state that they, what they believe they, that they're doing what they should be doing. But regardless, this is really important information because without actual knowledge about how much they're using, mm -hmm. it's less likely for customers to, to value making a change. So it's gotta be part of our programs moving forward. Next slide. We also found that customers care about beauty first and foremost. That was, that was clear, 58, 55% of customers stated that. Easy care and functionality um, were also important and notably water, uh, low water use was important. We also found that customers definition of beauty, it differs from customer to customer. And through this COVID pandemic, we have learned that customers want usable outdoor living space. This could be a, a space for outdoor seating, a place for kids and dogs to play, a fire pit, a veggie garden. They want usable outdoor space. 
And wh what's really important and critical to understand here is that we have to craft our programs and outreach based upon what customers want. You know, it's, it's, it's you know, our, the old message of saving water, saving money, it, it doesn't resonate with this next level of customers. We're gonna have to lead with the messaging of beauty, with usable outdoor space, and providing personal choices. Next slide. Another interesting note is that the majority of customers are not satisfied with their current last landscaping. Literally 78% are somewhat satisfied, somewhat dissatisfied, or very dissatisfied with their existing landscaping. And there's really an opportunity, I think, for us to, to spur action by showing customers that they can have something better, something beautiful, something usable, and at the same time, something water efficient. Next slide. And what customers are telling us loud and clear is that they need help. 85% virtually said that they needed help. 45% said they need a financial incentive, 22% that they wanted help with plant selection and layout, but 85% um, of customers need some sort of help. That they need customers, today's customers expect help. <laughs> they expect personalized service that is tailored to their needs. So we have to offer this. Customers need support and encouragement through the entire process. And as they navigate what, you know, the complexities of, you know, lawn replacement programs and even irrigation timer rebates, they are complex and they really are, require a lot of handholding for the customer. Next slide. So their customers do have concerns about removing their lawns. They identified cost as the number one concern. Um, um, second was the final look. And third was the difficulty of making the change. They also clearly stated that they need help. Design support was the main um, element that they needed help with, but also with implementation and irrigation installation. For, for us to have successful programs, we're gonna have to, we're gonna need to address all of these issues. Next slide. The good news was that the great ma majority of customers that did take out their lawn are happy with their new lawn and their no low water use landscape. They feel it was worth the investment. In addition, 60% of customers actually knew a neighbor or friend who took out their lawn and 86% of them were either neutral or liked the new landscape. And this, this really shows us that customers are, are accepting and embracing water efficient landscapes. We just, we just need to help them along the path. Next slide. So we talked a bit about customer barriers, you know, cost is the lack of knowledge, misperceptions about how much water they use outdoors, just being worried about the new look and the, the fact that it's, you know, the ease of landscape maintenance and their feelings about their ability to actually implement projects and really their indifference to the offer are all really customer barriers that we need to address. However, there are program supply chain and contractor barriers that clearly came out in the program evaluation that need to be addressed in order for us to truly transform the market. Um, programs are complicated. A lot of programs have extremely strict requirements and see a significant fallout rate. I just evaluated a program here in California and they had a 90% fallout rate. Just making the pro, you know, just having the, the cost, all of the processes and the restrictions that they held on customers just became too complicated and customers didn't finish the, and don't finish the projects. Um, also, the financial incentives. Um, we, you know, some of the programs offered less than a dollar. Most of them around a dollar or two dollars. Vegas was at three dollars. There, there is, there is a number that works. I believe it's somewhere between two and three that customers respond to because it has to pay for a, a, a significant portion of their investment. Um, and also, and then the supply chain. Most programs don't even involve the supply chain. Um, as an industry, we are not working with manufacturers. Um, we are 
we are, we are, most programs don't include the contractors as part of the, they don't incentivize the contractors as part of the sales process. And they have the, you know, the most influence over the customer. They have the direct connection. But we also found that a lot of contractors don't have the required knowledge or incentive that, you know, the, the business model doesn't, doesn't, doesn't work for them. There really isn't a, a section, a, an industry that's targeting the 1,000 square foot lawns. The large contractors are not, they're not, they don't want to uh, um, serve that market. And the small contractors just don't have the knowledge or skills to be able to do it. So the, the, the business place is, is really unclear. Next slide. So moving forward, so moving forward, we, so as with all of our water efficiency efforts, we have to educate customers about their outdoor water use. So they value making the change or, or the upgrade that that's foundational. But it's not just education. We have to we have to better connect customers with something that they want. You know, doing things like using big data and predictive analytics and profiling customers so that we can understand are you know not everyone's ready to take out their their lawn. It may be that we need to bring people in at the you know with a smart timer or high efficiency sprinkler nozzles because they, they just aren't ready to take out their lawn or maybe they're only ready to take out part of their lawn. We need to figure out where customers fit in this path, profile them, and then connect and then send messaging to them that the pitch that most resonates with them. Maybe, maybe it is an outdoor space or a veggie garden or a place for their grandkids to play or a smart yard with the latest technology. We have to figure out the message that best resonates with them and reach them through outreach methods in which they, they get information, be it email or social media, and do it often. Do it often and with the messaging that resonates. Um, this requires a significant investment. I think agencies have to be prepared to spend you know, 10 to 30% of their budget just on marketing. Vegas spends over a million, one of the most successful programs in the nation, Vegas spends over a million dollars a year on marketing. And they are beginning to do a lot of targeted marketing, which is really critical. We have to find, we have, it's not worth it to market to everybody about lawn replacement when only a small percentage are ready to do it. We have to find the customers that are going to do it and it's going to be worthwhile to them. And those usually are going to be the larger lots, the larger landscapes and the higher water use customers. Um, for landscape program design, agencies have to also find an equilibrium with incentive levels, program requirements, and support services. These are, I know that these are expensive programs, but um, you know, every agency's territory is unique. The climate profile, the customer environmental attitudes, the water supply, this, the, all of these things need to be considered when you're looking at designing a program. And, but one of the things just to pay a lot of attention to is balancing the requirements. Because if you make it too hard, you're going to have a high fallout rate. Yet if you make it too easy, which you know we saw in one you know in some of our Southern California uh, programs during the the drought was if you make it too easy with limited plant requirements or irrigation requirements, then you don't get high quality projects. And one thing that we know with high quality projects is that when you see a neighbor's project that you know a lawn replacement uh, project at your neighbor or friend that works, um, that, that looks good, they're likely to do it themselves. A study done in Western uh, Municipal Water District here in Western Riverside in California found that for every, every customer that received a rebate, an additional customer actually took out their lawn too because they had high quality projects that customers found beautiful and then decided to do it on, the, on their own. Um, it's also necessary to provide personalized service and support. Customers really get stuck from the very beginning of just thinking about the program, the design, what should they do, where do they get plants, how, you know, how, where contractors available to do this. We'll, we really need to provide personalized service and support through every handholding, through every step of, of the way. 
And lastly, it's, it's critical, it's just critical to integrate the supply chain partners to leverage their customer connection and ensure that the, the quality outcomes. Um, we need to do what we did with the old toilet programs where we, we, we really penetrated that market and apply it to the landscape market. You know, when we did this, toilet manufacturers retooled their manufacturing sites and participated in testing and quality standards. Retailers labeled and promoted products on their own. And plumbing companies built business models specifically around selling efficiency. We, that model, we need to apply to the landscape industry. We need to work closely with the supply chain, manufacturers, suppliers, contractors, and incentivize them to innovate products, to develop customer solutions, to promote efficiency, to educate customers. This will all drive response. It would be fantastic to form a, a national task force to work with manufacturers so that they develop more innovative products and create testing and cert certification and labeling to basically to improve products and how they're presented to, to, cu to customers and their customers. Um, and help, um, and, and we also need to help contractors sell. Make, get a list of targeted customers and help contractor and co-sell with them provide them with the resources you know return on investment calculators car sign truck signs business cards flyers anything that can help them sell to their customers so that they can build a business model around selling efficiency incentivize nurseries to carry and promote regionally appropriate plants the, our solution really needs to be holistic from addressing customer emotions to contractor training and support. All of this will, will really help us drive the landscape transformation. And with that, I think the next slide. Great, thanks. You know, in the end, you know, this is going to have to be a methodical approach. And the, the, our end game is that the supply chain and contractors shift to efficient technologies and services, that consumers prefer these new efficient technologies and services, and that they're readily available for them. And the old technology is no longer available. And possibly regulations are enacted stating that the new technology or limiting, you know, lawns is required by standards. That's, that's our long game. And with that, I think I'll turn it back over to Marianne where she can talk about kind of some of the next steps in from the Alliance for Water Efficiency. Okay, thanks Maureen. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. So what's next? Um, we mentioned a little earlier that we didn't look at the issue of rainwater harvesting and alternate sources of water with respect to landscape transformation. That's certainly a, a topic area we could look at. Um, but here's a list of, of a lot of other uh, topics that came out of this study as well as came out of our phase one initial research. You know, Maureen talked a lot about landscape design standards, you know, that that's a very important factor in insurance success. How, how should we research that to make sure we, we advise people on the best possible design standards? Uh, supply chain research, uh, we've not really done much of that as Maureen mentioned, so that is potentially something we could look at. Uh, impact evaluation in real time, customer outreach and messaging. Um, and then tying outdoor water use to drought management. Um, the drought restriction study looks a little bit at this, but not necessarily in, in a broader sense. Uh, connecting how uh, landscapes are managed and connecting it back to how you stay resilient for drought, that's all part of uh, a topic area that we could, we could stand to have additional guidance for our water utility uh, members and uh, those who are needing to reduce their outdoor water use. Uh, so these are all areas for future research. We've completed three studies. We'd love to do another. We, we don't want to sort of close the door on the Outdoor Water Savings Initiative without doing some more work. So we'd be really interested in, uh, in the discussion period that we're going to have, what your ideas and suggestions might be for how we might move forward in this area. Uh, next slide. 
So just to summarize what we're making available to you um, in the, the market analysis, the 2018 market analysis and recommendations that cover, that's what Maureen talked about. Um, the analytics report, which is right next to it, that's Tom Chestnut's work. I'm sure <laughs> inside there, Clint, he does describe how he normalizes for weather, but, um, but you know, we'll, we'll get you an answer on that one. Um, then down below, there's the executive summary of the landscape transformation study that's publicly available to everyone. Uh, there's also a fact sheet uh, that's available. Um, if you're a member of the Alliance for Water Efficiency, you get a lot of expanded program descriptive material, um, but there's a lot of information available to everyone as well. Um, so there's the, the link uh, where you can access all of this information, um, including the infographic. and. Um, uh, we urge you to take a look at it. We think, especially the, the market analysis and recommendations findings, we don't know that anybody has really done that kind of work before. Some of the utilities had done, you know, analytics in terms of their savings. Um, and we tried to create a, a uniform platform for analyzing those savings across all of those different case studies. But the market analysis piece is a really new piece and very important work. And, um, you know, we want to move forward a lot of Maureen's recommendations. She gave us a very detailed list here of all the things we need to do and how we should script that together is important. So one of the things we did do at the Alliance for Water Efficiency is we took a lot of those lessons from this landscape transformation study and we put together a guidebook for utilities. Uh, again, that's uh, it's for our AWE members, but it, it, it helps uh, design helps a utility design a landscape transformation program that has all of these elements that we've been discussing today on this uh, in this presentation. So I think our last slide is just um, a contact slide. So if, um, you'll see our emails there, uh, both mine and Maureen's, and uh, we are happy to answer any questions that you all might have. Uh, we've been very happy to work with uh, Austin on this study. Um, we'd love to do more work in Texas. Um, and so, and we're very happy to be part of this outdoor watering summit. So uh, Holly, I will turn it over back to you. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you, Marianne and Maureen, both for this most useful information. We do have a few minutes for questions. Um, so I will begin by posing this to both of you. The first question is, what is the most important thing to bring customers in? In other words, what tips the scale for customer participation in landscape transformation? I think that, I mean, I personally think it's, it's very personal. I don't think you can say it's one thing or another because I think that everyone's definition and why they're doing it really differs. And so that's where profiling customers, I think we need to spend some investment and understand who, you know, I've done some beginnings of some analytics for a customer out here in um, California. And, you know, there is, you know, there, there definitely is some age and, you know, um, age and income and things like that, that are impact that are, that are profiles of customers. In what's interesting is that in Vegas, they customers actually because they've done such a great job and actually sat, you know have a pretty significant saturation customers actually see the properties that have landscape transformation as having more value because the ho housing prices sell 10 to 18 percent higher if they have a new landscape because it's seen as modern and I think that, I think we just, ha we're going to have, we ha I think we have to figure out, we have to better profile past participants to understand how we market new participants. So one of the best ways to market to new participants is for them to see another landscape in their neighborhood that has been similarly transformed. And Maureen mentioned in her remarks, what we call the spillover effect. When, when someone does the exact same thing as a neighbor because they like what the neighbor did, but they didn't get the incentive to do it, they just did it on their own. That's, uh, that's the reverse of a free rider, that's a spillover benefit. And what we have seen too, is that when you've got a community where there's one landscape that's been changed out and everybody loves it, there's a copycat effect. And those copycat customers will be motivated to do that. And it's finding them, it's finding 
somebody in a neighborhood who was willing to be the first and to pilot this kind of landscape design in their neighborhood. And uh, there, there was a program idea that was submitted for a grant proposal in California at one point where they were going to identify one property owner in a bunch of different neighborhoods to start that spillover effect. Yeah. Unfortunately, the project didn't get funded, but it's, it's, it's an interesting idea. It's an interesting marketing concept because people respond to beauty. People respond to something that they think looks really cool and, as Mo said, modern. Um, so that's part of how we have to figure right. out how to market in the future. I, I think, so. yeah, and share like sharing those beauty, beautiful images in in a more modern way too. You know, um, figuring out how to share case studies and testimonials and and garden tours in an electronic format, as well as in person too. I think you know in Long Beach um, when they were you know a couple of years back they do an annual garden tour and they get three thousand attendees, three thousand attendees. And they have, again, one of the highest participations in programs because people see landscapes that they, that they relate to they, and, and different landscapes because everyone's is different. You know, maybe it's a cottage, maybe it's a native, maybe it's a Mediterranean, you know, so that they can see beautiful landscapes that appeal to them. Right. Thank you so much for both of you for answering that. The next question comes from Patsy Papp. Uh, she says she did not see any discussion about the use of the use of compost. Do you know the cost benefit equations? I... Well, uh, no, we didn't look at compost in this study at all. I mean, we looked at mulch, but we didn't look at compost, right, Maureen? That wasn't part of the study at all. Yeah. Uh, again, that's that's one for the research list then. Because we don't Absolutely. have any cost benefit information on, on that. I don't know, you know, maybe there are other researchers like AgriLife that have looked at this, but we, we haven't. Right, fair enough. Thank you so much. Uh, the next question comes from Milan. The, regarding supply chain management, did the availability of organic materials rather than chemical ones appear in this analysis of this sector? No, we didn't really address that question either. We really focused on sort of the standard availabilities from designers, contractors, plant availability. We, you know, we, we did have limitations with the number of questions that we could ask in the survey, but that is interesting. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Next question. Uh, can either of you, both of you, give uh, a couple of examples of engaging and working with supply chain? Uh, for example, partnerships with nurseries, et cetera. Yeah, I think I would give an example of what's being done in Moulton Nigel here in Southern California is that they've created a program where they've, they have a partnership or hired um, a, 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 a company that they have a designer who does, has some design templates and they're, they're somewhat templates, but they're customized templates. And then you have the nursery that provides the native plants and they'll come in and do a direct installation of they'll remove the lawn and install the native plants. And they've seen extreme, you know, they haven't done that many projects, but the success with the projects has been fabulous. Customers are extremely happy. They did their first tour and it, they just had you know, 30 sites where customers were there and they got to tour, or, uh, the property owners were there, customers got to tour it, talk to the customers about the process. And it's just, it's super, it's really successful, just the, the full, holistic turnkey approach of involving the entire supply chain. One of the issues with supply chain is the differences in the supply chain. So a nursery and approaching a nursery is going to be very different than working with yeah. say Home Depot. You know, Home Depot yeah. sells plants and, and caters to the customer too, but they don't provide the same kind of service that a nursery would do. So one of the things that California did years ago was they established a program called California Friendly, where um, climate appropriate plants as well as natives were labeled California friendly when they were low water using plants. And all the nurseries were encouraged to adopt that labeling. Um, and I don't know, Mo, if that is continuing um, to Not, this day. It's kind I mean, of fizzled out. Yeah, it definitely fizzled out because it's, it's hard to maintain. And I think, I think, you know, you need to work with your local industries, but as an, as an industry, I think we need to work with the national change so that there's some, you know, economies across all, you know, and consistency across all of, in all of the areas. 
Um, they're doing some work here again in California with um, Native and the, the, um, the, the Native Plant Society and creating some labels for that, but it hasn't, it's only been deployed at local nurseries, not chains. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you so much. And then I think we have time for just one final question. Um, how can water utilities have input on the studies that the Alliance for Water Efficiency undertakes? <laughs> what does it take to have your community included in one of the studies? Oh, I love this question. I knew you would. <laughs> I, love I wanted this to question. make sure I got it in. <laughs> oh, thank you, Holly. Oh, of course, we are very interested in uh, whatever water utilities are interested in in terms of research. The way we set this up, we have, uh, if you're an Alliance for Water Efficiency member, that's good. That's the first step is to join us. And then when you join us, you can be part of our research committee. And our research committee identifies our research objectives. For example, we're doing a, a massive study on cooling technologies and cooling towers right now. And that was suggested by our uh, research committee. And anyone who is interested in, in donating their data to be part of this study, uh, contributing to be part of this study, we do often pass the hat. The outdoor water savings studies were all funded by the utility partners. So if you're willing to be part of this and to uh, supply your data and to provide you know, a small contribution to get the study together, uh, we can do a lot of great combined work with a lot of individual partners. Um, landscape transformation study would not have been possible without those 17 funding partners. So we'd love to have you. And uh, Please, uh, please do uh, join us and let us know what, uh, what you think and what you'd like to see. Thank you so much, Marianne. Thank you both. Um, I, uh, that, that about wraps up the time that we have available. I will uh, encourage both of you ladies to stick around if you can. There are a couple of questions still continuing to pop up in the Q&A um, section. So if you would uh, be so gracious as to answer those, we would appreciate that. And, uh, thank you for both of your wonderful presentations, very informative, and I will turn it over to Jennifer. Thank you all. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Maureen. Thank you, Marianne. Um, it's always really great to hear about studies from the Alliance. Um, I saw Maureen present on, on the, um, the readiness study last summer, and I just thought the information was really great. Um, I used to work at a plant nursery and help customers choose their plants back before I did this. And, um, you know, it's a definitely different perspective of helping folks really want to do good stuff to their lawns and, um, I mean, their lawns, their yards and make lovely spaces. And, and they really do have a lot of questions and need help. So that really solidified what I know um, from experience. Um,